Thank you very much, uh, Matteo, and uh, thank you everyone for bearing with me. And um, so today we're going to uh, we're going to take a little step back again on basis function regression because I do remember that last week uh, I had made uh, well, let's say I was less than totally clear in my final explanations. So. Let me share the whiteboard. And hopefully we'll make it clearer this time. And, uh, uh, but I mean, should you have any questions, then just uh, interrupt me and, and, and ask. So. Continued. Okay, so the setup is we want to perform a regression. That would be the, the standard setup uh, where we have observations yi that are uh, a function of some input xi. Typically, we'll take yi to be a scalar and xi to be uh, a vector plus some uh, linear uh, Gaussian noise, with variance sigma squared, zero mean. And uh, we make the, the ansatz uh, that are f of xi. In the case of linear regression, uh, we did assume that this was a, a, an affine function of the inputs. And in this case, instead, we're going to say it's a, it's a linear combination of a set of nonlinear features, which we also call basis functions. So you can think, think of these as if you are extracting nonlinear features out of your input, but your nonlinear features are fixed functions and they're called basis functions. And we sometimes, uh, for convenience, we'll write it as a weight vector times a vector, a dot product with a vector where now the capital phi is the vector of phi one up to uh, phi, uh, let's say D if we're extracting D features here. Yeah? Now, what we have seen is that a priori, so from, from, from the prior, if we put W as a, a normal spherical zero mean Gaussian prior over the, the weight vector, then that means that the function itself F is a random function Okay, because it's a, it's a linear combination with random coefficients of a fixed set of functions. So its value at any one point is a random variable. And a priori, expectation under P of W of F of X is zero everywhere. And expectation under P of W, so under the prior over the weights of F of X, I f of x j by a very simple calculation uh, turns out to be phi transposed of oh I wish this didn't happen uh, what is it phi transposed of x i Phi transpose, uh, phi not transposed. Of X, J. Okay, and so what we've seen is that the variable F a priori is 
a random variable with zero mean and covariance, the two point correlation function is uniquely determined by the fees. Okay, by the choice of the set of basis function that tells you what type of correlations your model admits a priori. And in particular, one thing that I try to, to make clear, so if the support of phi is, well, or I mean, if as is natural, let's say, suppose now that uh, if phi tends to zero, as say x tend to infinity, okay, because the covariances are like this, the correlations are like this, the, the, the variance, which is the one that you evaluate when you take the expectation of f of x times f of x is the square of these phi. And if your uh, x happens to fall to be very large, so to be in particular to be outside of the region that you wish to model. Uh, okay, so what's happening here? And for large x, uh, then the, the variance of f of x will become essentially zero, okay? So a priori, because of this formula, your choice of having basis function, if you make a choice of having basis functions that are localized, then you are basically saying that your function is not only in expectation zero everywhere, but also that the level of confidence you have on this prior expectation, which is expressed by the variance, becomes extremely high as x becomes large. Now, some people said, okay, well, I, I made it a kind of example of saying, suppose you have data okay then what i was trying to say is that you know you typically in this case you would choose um your uh um you would choose your data to be um your your basis functions to be localized near where the data is that's a typical choice that people make. So you might want to choose these as a set of basis functions. Maybe you could go a little bit beyond the data just to be on the safe side. But this kind of choice would imply that, you know, whatever combination of weights you choose, your function will always be zero and certainly zero when you go very far from where your data is. Now, people objected, well, but if you have data, then you're not going to take points from the prior. And that is very true. So if I have data, then the kind of uh, distribution under which I would compute my expectations of the random function is no longer the prior, would be the posterior. So the question now becomes, what is the posterior over the weights? Well, so the situation is now I'll have, set, uh, I'll have pairs, I'll have a set of IID observations, yi, xi, for i equals one to n, and I have them an independent and identically distributed. And I'll have my regression equation, which is yi w transposed phi, x i plus epsilon i. And now all the calculations will go through exactly in the same way as they did into linear regression, except that instead of having x, you will have phi of x. So 
what is going to be, uh, how, how are we going to compute the posterior over Y in this case, over W in this case, okay? So P of W conditioned on the data and also on the noise variance sigma squared, but it's going to be proportional to the um, likelihood, which is a product i equals one to n of uh, Gaussian terms Okay, so these are likelihood terms times the prior. And that it, since it's uh, the prior, uh, we have that the prior of a W is, it's got unitary variance, the prior of epsilon and the, Okay, and now I'll I've got a product of exponentials. So that becomes the exponential of, of the sum. And then I will have a term plus um, and now of course this is still going to be a quadratic form in W because there is nothing uh, to um, you know not, not, nothing different from um, the fact that we're simply extracting nonlinear features out of your, of our axis. And uh, uh, as a result, this is still a Gaussian. And, and as a Gaussian, I should be able to write I should be able to write it as a normal of a certain mean M and a certain covariance C. Okay. Now I have to learn what the, this is a matrix and this is a, a vector. Now I have to learn what the mean of the posterior and the covariance of the posterior are. And how do I do that? Well, I have to look at what are the quadratic terms in here to identify what C is and what the linear term in here is. Okay. So if I do that, then I get that C has to be equal to, you see C is the quadratic term here would be W transpose C minus one times W. So C minus one is going to be equal to uh, an identity plus a sum uh, of one over sigma squared. So instead of a sum, I can just put an n plus n over sigma squared. Okay, times, I oh, know, sorry, I, this is wrong. That's what happens when you try to do it. So it's going to be a sum of one over sigma squared i equals one to n phi computed at x i uh, times phi transposed computed at x i. Okay. So if you look here, you know, the quadratic terms, I will have 
W transposed phi of xi times phi transposed W of xi. Uh, phi transpose of xi, w. So we will have a w transpose phi phi transpose w. Okay. So this is the inverse of the covariance, and I'll just invert both sides just to have the actual covariance. Okay, so this is the posterior covariance over the weights. And then the posterior mean, well, on this side, I will have something like W transposed C to the minus one. Okay, so on one side, I will have C to the minus one M that's the coefficient of W. And on this side, well, there is no linear term here, but the linear terms come from here and they would be of the form W transpose phi of Xi times Yi divided by sigma squared and sum over N. So here it's sum I equals one to N of phi one over sigma squared phi of xi times yi. So if I multiply both sides by c, I'm going to get that the posterior mean is equal to c times this vector, which is a linear combination of the basis functions. Yeah, evaluated at the observations. Let's take the one over sigma squared here in the front. So this is the uh, posterior over the weights. Okay, this is the posterior over the weights. So if I were to go back to this setup, now the functions, the ensemble, the random functions that fit the data somehow are functions obtained as a linear combinations of these basis functions with weights drawn from the posterior, yeah? Drawn from this Gaussian with this mean and this covariance, okay? Now, what changes? Well, the change the main change now, if uh, yes, there is a question I can see. Uh, I need to get back to it. No. Is there any, uh, so, okay. So there is a question, is there any significance if the mean would be equal to zero? Um, so the mean, you know, the, the only way in which the mean would be equal to zero, this is a non, non is an invertible matrix, yeah? So in general, these won't do anything. So for the mean to be equal to zero, uh, you can either have your fees that are zero at the point where you have the input observations, which would be a very odd choice because remember that the basis functions is something that you choose or would be very unfortunate or that your observations are all zero. If all your observations are zero, then your mean would be zero and your function would still be zero uh, in expectation everywhere. But in practice, you don't expect, you know, if your data looks like uh, what we have in the figure in the second slide, you know, if your data looks like this, 
the weights will not be zero. The weights will be such that um, the expected uh, function, let's draw it in, in, uh, in orange. So the expected function will probably be something that goes somewhere around the data and then goes back to zero when you're far. So this would be kind of, you know, this would be expectation under P of W given Y Xi of F of X. So you don't expect your posterior mean function to be zero, but what do you expect it? What, what is it going to be? So let, let's do this calculation now. Eh? So we need to compute expectation under the posterior sigma squared, which we're still conditioning, of f of x. And this f of x, we can uh, so, and I'm going, I'm now going to write it in the posterior a little bit more succinctly. Yeah, so this thing I'm going to call the data. So this is W transpose times phi of X. And now the expectation is linear. Phi of x is not uh, a random variable because these are fixed functions. So this is going to be equal to the mean times phi of x, the vector made up of the basis functions. So in this case, where the set of basis functions was a finite set and they all had the property that they um, went to zero as x became large, we're still getting something that, I mean, this, this, is, a, this is a set of, it's a constant, yeah? I mean, once you plug in xi and you plug in yi, then this is just a constant vector. And it's times a set of functions, all of which go to zero at infinity. So this still goes to zero at infinity. What about, and that's okay, we don't mind that. What about the expectation under the posterior of um, the variance or the, of the function. Now here, unfortunately, I do have to uh, subtract the mean because now this is no longer zero mean. So the computation is a little bit more complicated. Okay. Uh, but you don't have to worry too much about this because as you can see, again, this is a constant matrix. So the second moment expectation of F squared is still going to be an expectation of WW transpose type thing. And multiplied by a phi phi transpose. So you still have a phi transposed a phi transposed of x times now the 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 covariance matrix plus some other terms, but they all contain phi squared. So these also will, I mean, you can work out this calculation as, as an exercise um, in, in, in detail, but also under the posterior, what is going to happen is that 
this will still tend to zero as x becomes large. But not that large, you know, basically what that means is that if I take functions of this type, basis functions of this type that cover the data, but just a little bit to the left and to the right, I actually will not be able to make any meaningful prediction because a prediction of zero with infinite confidence is not a meaningful prediction when I'm far from the data, yeah? So any prediction with infinite confidence is not a meaningful prediction in a Bayesian setting. So the fundamental flaw of basis function regression remains whether you choose to use the prior or you choose to use the posterior measure to average over your weights. Yeah? And that makes perfect sense because if under the prior, what you get is that uh, you know you have a priori zero variance on the random variable function of x where x is far from the data there is no data that will be able to change a zero variance so in in the bayesian setup you can't uh, you know if something is certain evidence cannot move certainty okay by the way uh, Matteo told me that uh, you've uh, requested uh, some exercises. Um, so I'll pass some exercises to uh, the course secretary. And But in general, if you look at the books that I've recommended, they do have exercises and they tend to be good exercises. On top of that, you will have noticed that sometimes when I'm too lazy to do a calculation in detail, I'll say I'll leave it as an exercise. Well, that's also a good exercise. Okay, so here's a good moment to take some questions. So, you know, we've eviscerated the issue that you identified last time that, yeah, okay, I mean, the prior may have zero, zero variance, but, but, you know, you're certainly not going to draw samples from the prior once you have seen some data. Even if you take samples from the posterior, which is what you would do, you're still going to get all of the functions that you sample from the posterior, rather all of the functions that you obtain, linear combinations of the basis functions with weights drawn from the posterior, they will all converge to zero when you're far from the data, and therefore, or when you're far from the support of the basis functions, and therefore you're going to have um, infinite certainty predictions away from the data. So this is the fundamental flaw of basis function regression. So excuse me, what is this method used for then? This method is used for interpolation. So if you have, uh, it, it's it's used for, 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 for interpolation, it's, it's a good method because, you know, suppose, well, let me give you an example from my actually my own work. A few years ago, I, I wrote a paper uh, that became relatively well known, uh, where we were analyzing using techniques not entirely dissimilar to these the dynamics of the um, Afghan war, as inferred from the data from um, WikiLeaks. Yeah, so these are almost 10 years ago now, but uh, you probably still know that WikiLeaks was this association that leaked a lot of geolocated data in Afghanistan. And so if you, uh, of the conflict in Afghanistan, yeah, so if you draw Afghanistan, which looks a little bit like this, what the data was telling you, you had a lot of dots along the country every week. And these were conflict events. Yeah? And so what we did, we, we modeled the dynamics of these across five years uh, from 2004 and 2009. And then we showed that, you know, you could, you know, this would be 2004 and this would be 2009. And then you could use the learned dynamics to predict what would have happened in 2010, which you could do reasonably well. And 
how did we do that? Well, we postulated a dynamical system where there were some latent variables, which were combinations of basis functions, which gave you the probability of an event happening. And uh, so the thing that evolved in time were the coefficients of the basis functions. And so you, you would have a set, we had a fixed set of basis functions, which essentially covered most of Afghanistan, but it didn't cover all of Afghanistan. If you will, if you will have noticed that I've um, drawn the dots kind of on a circle. And the reason is that there is something called the ring road in Afghanistan, which basically there are some mountains here in the middle, uh, which are essentially uninhabited. And we had no data whatsoever here. So in that case, it was a, a reasonable to use a set of basis functions which were two-dimensional and would be localized to the positions where we were interested in making um, in making predictions. I mean, we were never interested in saying, okay, so we were interested in learning the dynamics, making time ahead predictions, but we weren't interested in saying, okay, let's, we've done Afghanistan, let's predict what's happening in Kazakhstan because we would have predicted zero with infinite confidence. It's just not something that we want to do. And so you predicted uh, future conflicts in this way? Well, we, we predicted future events within the same conflict. But I mean, if you're interested, then the, the, the reference um, is, um, and I mean, it off uses uh, things a little bit more advanced because it uses these things. But, but, the sorry, first... but, but I have another question. Suppose that you have, um, suppose that you have uh, uh, a dynamic, which is very high dimensional. So you have a very high dimensional dynamic and uh, you find out that it follows a trajectory. So you have very high dimensional uh, data and uh, the experiment is repeated, uh, for example, uh, every day uh -huh. for, uh, for a long time. Every day they do the experiment and uh, the data you have are very high dimensional. You do a little bit of a PCA and you find out that uh, the intrinsic dimensionality of the data is uh, almost one. So mm -hmm. it, it's like uh, a point trajectory in this uh, very high dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, uh, I'm moving through space, so I can't really use uh, uh, this kind of uh, models because these required to be some somehow localized in the future. Well, I mean, it depends because you know your data. So take take this example. Yeah. So the data was two D, but in effect, the dynamical system that we were defining was we had about a hundred basis functions. So we were defining a dynamical system over the one hundred dimensional space of the coefficients. And then, of course, this will have swept an orbit in that, uh, or, or you know, a trajectory in that. So uh, it gave a measure on something that would have had lower dimensionality than a whole a hundred times the number of time points. But you know, that was still okay. But yeah, so these methods are used primarily for you know regression or geostatistics or things like that. But, yes, but my question in the end was, uh, what if I have uh, something like that, something like what I described, and I want to predict the next step? How would I be able to use a model like this? Like, I can predict, for example, the next difference, because if then I pass the differences between steps, I obtain something localized in space. So, so I mean, so, you know, we we're, we're moving a little bit further from the topic of the lectures, but what you would, you know, these models do not have the concept of time as I'm mentioning now, yeah? So, okay, so I have a cartoon which is one dimensional, but this is not time, yeah? I'm not using it as time. So to predict in time, you have to have some sort of dynamics. So you have to say, okay, there is some law that tells me what xt would be given previous observation, previous values of the state, yeah? And this could be a Markovian dynamics or it could be non-Markovian, it could be something that has coefficients that you learn from data by observing a time series or, or whatever, but you still need to have that. While here, we're not, f of x is not something that has its own evolution, it's something that we just see instances of, 
and there is no concept of time at all. So, I mean, obviously time, time series analysis is a, a very, very interesting topic in its own right, but um, I'm not covering it in these lectures, but, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about it uh, separately if you wish. Uh, but, but for the time being, I would like to carry on on uh, regression, which is still a very useful thing. Okay, sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more questions? Um, okay, I don't see anything in the chat, so I'll assume that everything was well, relatively clear. And uh, um, so what I wanted to talk to you now, and this might be really reasonably the, the, the final topic of this mini course is um, something called uh, Gaussian processes. Um, which is a way to avoid the pathologies that we've seen in the case of basis function regression. So basis function regression gave us the opportunity to um, model some more complex relationships, not just linear relationships, and uh, but came with the cost that the choice of basis functions essentially completely determined, in some cases, some of the properties of the functions you were going to um, produce from your random model. But importantly, they showed that there exist um, probability distributions over functions. Now, there is a formal mathematical way to go about, but you could take uh, the case of um, if you take an infinite collection of basis functions, yeah, so the, you see all of the problems that we were having of certain uh, predictions with absolute certainty far from the data were linked to the fact that the basis functions had to be chosen to be finite, a finite set, and therefore that caused the pathologies. If we were able to take an infinite set of basis functions, uh, which spanned the whole space, then uh, what we would see is that um, we would get, sure, your, your um, covariance would still be um, determined. Uh, come on, pen work. So your covariance would still be determined by the choice of basis functions, uh, but uh, where was it? Yeah, but your variance, I mean, if your set of fees does not go to zero at infinity, but you keep having fees, then your variance would not be zero when you're far from the data, would be whatever the square of the function there is. And that is the idea beyond Gaussian pro be behind Gaussian processes. So they're essentially, they're a regression with an infinite collection of basis function. Yeah. The reference for this is the, the book by Rasmussen and Williams. Uh, Gaussian processes for machine learning. And it's chapter two. Yeah, chapter two, I very much recommend reading it. Also, it gives you a very good description of basis function regression. So, the um, the point of view of an infinite collection of basis function is what people call the weight space view. 
And here I refer to the terminology used in this book. I'm going to concentrate on what people call the function space. This is the one that, you know, we will use this. Okay. What is the function space view of Gaussian processes? Essentially, it's a more axiomatic um, view. And the definition So a Gaussian process is uh, an infinite collection of random variables indexed by the index X, which lives in R to the D, such that for every finite collection, X1, Xn, the vector obtained by evaluating, uh, so is an infinite collection of random variables, F, the vector f of x1, f of xn is uh, Gaussian distributed. And so there is, a, 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 so we have that this vector here. Yeah, here, f, f of x1, f of xn is drawn from, uh, so we, we denote these by um, g, p, mu, k. is a Gaussian distribution. So if we evaluate this infinite collection on a set, so if you take a sub index set from your infinite index X, then you have that um, it's a multivariate Gaussian with mean given by the evaluation of this mu function on the um, collection of points, that's the, the mean vector, mean function, and covariance k, where k i j is given by evaluating a function of two arguments on pairs of input points. And so this is a fairly abstract definition. What it's telling us is the GP is a stochastic process, which is an infinite collection of random variables indexed by whatever variable that we call the input, such that any finite dimensional marginal is a multivariate Gaussian. Okay, so why do we call it finite dimensional marginal? Because you have to think of having marginalized every other value of X except for these N ones. Yeah? So if we take N input values, then we obtain a vector evaluating these random variable over these input values. So we draw a random variable, which is an infinite object. And then it's got an infinite index set. Then we take a finite subset of that index set. In this way, we get a finite set of random variables and they happen to be Gaussian. That's the definition. They are Gaussian. If they're Gaussian, then they have a mean and a variance covariance matrix. How do I get the mean and the variance covariance matrix? Well, there exists two functions, one function of one variable. So mu is a function 
mu goes from the input space r to the d or the index set if you prefer to r and k is a function of two variables so it takes pairs of inputs and returns one value which is the covariance between those two the covariance of the random variables function evaluated at xi function evaluated at xj okay so this now avoids the problem of uh, basis functions regression because you know it all depends of course on what this uh, on what this k function is but a typical choice is stationary is of stationary Gaussian processes or stationary stationary Gaussian processes that means that k of xi xj is a function only of the distance between xi and xj. So in practice, this implies that the, the variance of f of x, okay, which uh, would be um, k x x minus m squared of x. If m, it, it only depends on, uh, on, on, on x through m, yeah? Because if it is stationary, then that means that, you know, this is always zero. And so it's always the same, yeah? Okay, because if I plug the same value here, I get k of zero and that does not depend on x. So it only depends, the variance would depend only on the, on the mean. So that's already so there's no sorry that that is already by definition so k is not the second moment it's already the variance covariance matrix so the variance is k xx and so this is um, independent of x okay so from this definition if I have a stationary Gaussian process I end up with um, a prior distribution over functions such that the prior variance is constant over the whole input space, which avoids the pitfall of basis function regression. Yeah? Now the questions, I mean, you might well ask, do Gaussian processes exist? And the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, so what do I need to do to uh, get the Gaussian process, well, I need to create such a, a collection and, oh, sorry, that the pen seems to be really giving me trouble these days. So clearly the choice of the mean is irrelevant. I could just, instead of taking as a random variable f, I could take f minus mu, and then I would get a zero mean Gaussian process. So what I need to, to worry about is the covariance. So to get um, to get a valid Gaussian process, 
you need k of xi xj to uh, provide a valid covariance matrix Uh, for every choice for every set of xi or let's say x1 x n okay so the question is i've given an abstract definition does this correspond to any reality well in order for it to be <clears throat> A real object that exists, I need to be able to construct it. And to be able to construct it, I need to be able to evaluate this function of two, two variables on all pairs of input points. And the thing that comes out needs to be the covariance matrix of a Gaussian process, of a Gaussian, of a multivariate Gaussian. Yeah? And the covariance matrices of a multivariate Gaussian are not any type of matrix, uh, but what you need is for it to be needs to be symmetric. So K XI XJ must be equal to K XJ XI and it needs to be positive definite. And um, there is a theorem which is called Mercer's that states <clears throat> conditions under which k can be a covariance function. The practice is that um, most covariance functions are constructed from a few existing and well-known covariance functions. Yeah? So the best known of all is the so-called uh, the radial basis functions covariance. I saw something in, did I see something in the chat? No. Radial basis functions covariance. So that means that K of X I X J is equal to um, an amplitude parameter A, A squared needs to be positive times the exponential of minus xi minus xj squared divided by lambda squared. Okay, so this is the by far the most widely used covariance function and has two hyperparameters amplitude. and length scale, which characterize the type of functions that you can sample from this particular Gaussian process. Now, we're a few minutes from the end of the lecture, and uh, but I think this is a fairly reasonable position to stop before starting showing you how you do computations and how you use in practice 
Gaussian processes. So if you have a few questions, this is probably the time to ask. And then tomorrow we'll see um, how Gaussian processes are used in practice and uh, how, uh, you know, a few topics that will be potentially uh, extensions you may want to look into. So I saw there was a question here. Uh, so the question, uh, I mean, it's probably best if you, um, if you ask uh, the questions to everyone, not just to me. So you said that you use this method. So basis function um, regression for uh, for my research. So why this method and why no other interpolation methods? Uh, because I don't just want, so, you know, I don't just want to interpolate between two points. I want to have something that is defined as a function so that I can use any new query point and obtain a value. Yeah. Well, you know, Newton interpolation, well, I mean, you know, if you, you could do linear interpolation and that would be like, for example, fitting uh, a piecewise linear function. Uh, and that would also be understandable in terms of uh, basis functions, but would depend entirely on, on the data because your, your basis functions would be determined from the data. It would be linear between data points and, and that's it. Instead, we want a global basis functions that fits the data but it's generally got fewer parameters than just interpolation between every pair of points. Any more uh, questions? Well, if there are no more questions, uh, let, let's stop here and uh, we'll pick it up from where we left it today, uh, tomorrow at the same time, quarter past three.